Lions game, too. First to note about the first game, which came right down to the final seconds, doesn't get much better than that. That's as good as we've seen at the final four. And for the Irish to endure the foul trouble, to relinquish the lead and still make the necessarily necessary plays on both sides, what a truly extraordinary effort for Muppet McGraw's team. Annually, we come to the final four and ask the same question. Can anybody beat Gino Oriema and the Yukon Huskies? Well, this is a team that has five players on the floor who can all score the ball, three of whom happen to be first-team All-Americans. And opposite them is Lexi Brown, a dynamic guard, one of three, in fact. And she had 10 of the final 14 points for Maryland against mighty Tennessee to lead this program to its second consecutive Final four and on the opposite side. It's the nation's best player the Wade winner Brianna Stewart who against Dayton made every play on both sides of the ball Offensively a scoring threat in a low post wreaking havoc on the defensive end not in my house Well, we asked Gino Oriema what separates him from other coaches he said if anything it was his ability to know the difference between good and great Time for the Capital One. Meet the players. Here are the UConn Huskies. Brianna Stewart, North Syracuse, New York, and I bring competitive drive to this team. I'm Kalina Mosqueda Lewis. Shout out to Orange County, California, and I bring three pointers to my team. I'm Kia Nurse from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and I bring competitiveness. I'm Mariah Jefferson from Dallas, Texas, and I'm the floor general of this team. My name is Morgan Tuck. I'm from Bolingbrook, Illinois, and I'm the style and assassin of the team. Right, time for us to bring in Holly Rowe, our sideline reporter, who's all calmed down after a terrific game one. Holly, we need more information about the Maryland Terrapins. Well, you know to beat UConn, it's got to be partially a mental game. And Maryland has been preparing all season to be stronger mentally through the help of a performance enhancement coach, Stu Singer. He met with the team last night, as he's done before every game. His message, this is not David versus Goliath. You're conference champions. You're on a school record 28-game win streak. Write your own story. He showed them the film of Mike Tyson, who was undefeated and dominant, going against Buster Douglas and unknown. Well, Buster Douglas got knocked down in the eighth round, but he got up after a nine count off the canvas and fought his way back. He knocked out Mike Tyson and shocked the world. His point, when things get tough against UConn tonight, you keep punching. And, oh, yeah, Brenda Freeze may have mentioned that Wisconsin shocked the world last night against Kentucky. They want to do the same thing tonight. Now, let's meet the Maryland players. I'm Lauren Mincy. I'm from North New Jersey. And what I bring to this team is senior leadership. I'm Shatori Walker-Kimbrough from Alacoba, Pennsylvania. And I bring fire to Maryland women's basketball. I'm Brianna Jones. I'm from Havity Grace, Maryland. And I'm the enforcer. I'm Lena Howard. I'm from Pittsburgh, Ohio. And I bring communication to the team. Hi, I'm Lexi Brown from Swanee, Georgia. One thing I bring to this team is a very sparkly personality. Well, Brenda Freeze is one of the elite coaches in America. This is her third Final Four. Here she is in the Maryland locker room before the game. You're going to want to be in this moment to shoot the ball with great confidence. And when you shoot the ball, that basket is going to feel like an ocean. That basket is going to feel like an ocean. You've got to understand, you want this moment. We dictate this moment. It's our moment. And we expect greatness tonight. We expect greatness tonight. And I'll tell you one last night, one last thing. We get to go out and tell our story tonight. We get to go out and tell our story tonight. You go out and show them what Maryland basketball is all about. Uh, Brenda had some fun with President Obama for not picking Maryland to go to the Final Four, despite the school's proximity to Washington, but she is all business tonight against UConn. Oh, the crowd is still buzzing, including Mr. Cruz, after watching game one, which is one of the best semifinals we have seen. Just pretty good mental toughness from Notre Dame to have so many players, as you see Dee Brown, Lexi's father in the house as well. Foul out of the ball game, relinquish the lead late, and still make the plays necessary. Steve Brown, uh, an assistant with a Sacramento franchise in the NBA. They're actually playing tonight. But he got a chance to come and watch his daughter. Inside, Mincy misfiring the first shot. 
on the run. Here's Tuck trying to beat the field. And what a quick strike. UConn, the first team to score in this national semi. UConn coming in at 36-1. Maryland at 34-2. and two. One of the things that you must do against UConn, as you see early, is you've got to play transition defense. And the first part of that is your shot selection. Offensive foul here will go against Maryland off the ball. And they're going to get Brianna Jones for her first. That brings a bit of a grin from Brenda Freeze. Now in her 13th year, working on Joe Vasili. For the Huskies, their eighth consecutive Final Four. Maryland, the man to man, Brianna Stewart gets delivered the ball because Howard couldn't handle her in the post. Brianna just won the Wade Trophy this weekend, the equivalent of the Heisman Trophy in women's college basketball as the number one player in the country. And in the second half against a Dayton team that gave everything UConn could handle for 20 minutes, it was Brianna Stewart's play and her vocal leadership that I thought made all the difference in the world. Here's Lexi Brown. His performance has run hot and cold. Nice scoop shot, because she can certainly do that. That's correct, and they can't afford her to have a scoreless half, so it's good to see her get off quickly. They almost get loose with an air ball there. Brown looking up the floor now. Maryland with tremendous guard play, and they came through the most challenging bracket in the tournament to reach Tampa. Inside for Jones, and that'll spin in. So two very good sets on the offensive end. You have got to be able to keep pace with Connecticut scoring. Jefferson back out for Nurse. He and Nurse, the talented freshman. Tuck into the lane. A little bit too strong. Terps trying to take their first lead. But Jefferson right there on the line with a nifty steal. And the spin. Mariah Jefferson, a newly minted All-American herself, and so deserving. Here's Nurse to launch, and knock it down, a three. Well, Mariah Jefferson masterfully manages the offense of the Connecticut Huskies. In transition, she's pointing to places she wants the screen and delivers the ball on time and on target. Huskies scoring 90 points a game, winning by an average of 42 points per game. That's an historic rate, a historic margin of victory. Mincy backing up, trying to spin on Tuck. Nice dish, and it's Jones for an easy two. So we always talk about you need great guard play against UConn. Poor decision by Jefferson. Lexi Brown with the theft. Gets an open look at a three. Rebound picked off by Morgan Tuck. Maryland strength. They have one ingredient that's crucial to winning at this time of the year, and that's quality guard play. Multiple players, Shatari Walker Kimbrough. Stewart. Very good. Working on Howard. Denied it. Gave it up. Brown trying to penetrate on Tuck. Denied there is Mincy for a three. And the rebound comes right underneath. And an easy two there by Shatori Walker Kimbrough. That's the player I just referenced. Now she helps them immensely on the glass. She's a dynamic athlete and capable scorer. Averaging about 13 and a half a game. Jefferson, her three. Yes, on that. That really puts teams in a bind. Early this season, you could sag off Mariah Jefferson, play five on four until she put an end to it with consistent range shooting. She hits over 50%. Mm. She's actually, percentage-wise, slightly better than Kalina Mosqueda Lewis, who's the best three-pointer in the history of the game. Knocked down by Mincy. So the key that you needed, all three of your playmaking guards have scored a basket. The last one, Mincy the fifth year senior. Stewart seems to save her best basketball for this time of the year. Twice she's already been named the most outstanding player of the final four. A foul here as Nurse tried to negotiate her way in as we are tied at 10. Maryland making back-to-back -back trips to the final four. Jones, Brianna Jones will pick up her second foul. So she's gonna have to come out immediately. That's their 6-3 center. Well, and their best back-to-the-basket score and force. And so that's a big loss. Stewart back out for Tuck. Trying to get by Howard. Blocked on a play. Terrific job there. Back out for Nurse. Inside, Nurse. And up on top of the backboard. Well, 
the dynamic guards from Maryland are off to a good start. And not surprisingly, the fifth-year senior, Lauren Mincy, who has overcome multiple knee injuries. The spin move, put it in the spin cycle, deliver it to your post player, easy basket inside. And then how about this? Can she score it? Oh, yes, ma'am. Little step back, sell it, soft touch, pretty. The NCAA Women's Championship is presented by Quicksilver from Capital One. Earn unlimited 1.5% cash back every purchase, every day. And in part by the all-new Can-Am Spider F3. Riding has evolved. And Wendy's, proud sponsor of the 2015 John R. Wooden Men's Player of the Year Award. Here's the great super, the legendary Yukon Husky. Taking in a national semifinal in a game that has started out with a rapid pace. It has, and you can tell, some nerves on both sides. As often as Connecticut has been there, and that's eight straight Final Fours, sort of mind-boggling. They're four for eight, but a couple of uncharacteristic turnovers. We've yet to see the best of Brianna Stewart. Now the closest game that UConn has been in since the November loss to Stanford, an overtime loss, the only one they suffered, was a 14-point victory over USF last month. Back out for Lexi. Let's see beyond the three-point line. Shot clock down to six here for the Terps. Mincy trying to take on Kalina Mosqueda Lewis, flips it up off the window, and it comes back out to UConn. They want to run. Kiara Leslie is not up the floor. Huskies playing five on four right now because Kiara Leslie is hurt. And reaching at her face, and it takes everything she has just to get to the side. So the six-foot freshman has played some big minutes in their tournament wins. Let's see what happened to her. It looks like her own teammate, perhaps Melina Howard. There's a lot of bodies flying around down there as the rebound is coming off. Tuck working on Howard. Back out for Nurse. Tuck on the back down. You're not going to stop that. So I said they had three first-team All-Americans in their lineup. Five people who could score on the floor. Tuck was not a first-team All-American. I thought she should have been. Lexi Brown launches way downtown, but in and out, Stewart grabs the one-handed rebound. Many agree with you about Tuck, maybe the most underrated, outstanding player here in Tampa as Jefferson gets hit. And she'll be at the foul line to shoot a pair. Yeah, just such a well-rounded, diverse player. Their best back-to-the-basket, low-post score, so sells the defender one way, the soft touch. It will be a major challenge at the four and five for Maryland to keep up with Tuck and Stewart. And now you're in a bind already because of Jones's foul trouble and Kiara Leslie's injury. Lexi Brown just picked up a foul, her first. Jefferson honored as an All-American by the WBCA along with teammates Brianna Stewart and Kalina Mosqueda Lewis and just about automatic at the line. And it, the Huskies continue to come with the soft pressure, a little 2-2-1. Two, two, now, they become a little more perimeter, Maryland, because Furman's on the floor. Vinci went down, gave up the dribble, and just tossed it into the backcourt. That's three turnovers for the Terrapins early. Now the Huskies trying to apply some of their trademark pressure on the offensive end. Tuck, only a sophomore. Jefferson beat everybody on that end for two. Boy, she quit. You can see the mastery with which she operates, simply understanding what the defense is giving her, understanding her speed is an asset. Walker Kimbrough, great fake, airborne, no, follows her own miss and lays it in. This is how Shatari Walker Kimbrough operates, in transition, off the offensive glass, opportunistic score. The Spokane region, most outstanding player. Jefferson again undaunted for two. She's going to be a problem all night. That speed will hurt. Already with nine points. She had a big game in the Sweet 16 against Texas, 25 points. Here's the game with Stewart, went off for 31. And they won by 51 points. Let's see, trying to direct traffic. 
The turnaround and a nice rainbow shot there by Furman. Yeah, she has got a lot of game and she's entered at a critical moment. They need some scoring. And she can do that in high school in Pennsylvania. She scored over 2,300 points. The junior. 18-14 UConn. The winner to take on Notre Dame. Jefferson straight on but short. Stewart wins the rebound battle. Back out for Kalina Mosqueda Lewis. Tuck grabs the rebound. There's two more. She has six early on. Morgan Tuck was huge in the Elite Eight win over Dayton. 23 points and eight rebounds. They're three, four, five. Kalina Mosqueda Lewis, Brianna Stewart, and Morgan Tuck were more than Dayton could handle in the second half. Although Dayton had the lead at halftime by one point. There was no panic in the Huskies, though, at halftime. They said Gino was as calm as I've ever seen him. Brown, oh, that was beautiful with a quick step. Yeah, she said she's battled confidence issues in this NCAA tournament. I don't know why. Stewart under the iron for two. How fast does it happen? You know, you, you get a bucket, you take a sigh of relief, and before you know it, they are at the 10. Four points for Brianna Stewart. And a quick whistle here. She had 26 against Maryland the last time they met back in late 2013. Nine for 16, seven rebounds. She kind of carved them up. Well, this is a player who saves her best games for the spotlight. And the last two final four most outstanding player awards have gone to that young woman. Kia Nurse just picked up her first foul. Here's Mincy. Leslie trying to take the baseline runs right in to a defender and turns it over Well, there is talent all over the floor for the Connecticut Huskies But the orchestrator the maestro with the ball in her hands in a program littered with great point guards Mariah Jefferson is carving her niche Changes speeds tucks the ball away like a running back softly off the tin and then off the screen and roll situation. Don't overcommit. I'll split that screen and hurt you. But UConn having a little fun. And on the floor as well. They head 22 to 16 over Maryland. Dave O'Brien, Doris Burke, and Holly Roll with you. Our second national semifinal of the evening. Notre Dame is already into the national championship game with a one-point Heart-pounding, heart-stopping victory over South Carolina. Escada Lewis with a misfire, and Maryland comes away. You see Maryland is having to mix and match some lineups already. Chloe Pavlik is in the basketball game. A rare sighting for a player who used to start. UConn is yet to sub. Mincy swings here for Lexi Brown. Made a couple of acrobatic shots already. Trying to get past Stewart. Shot clock's down to six. She looks up at the clock. The bounce feed here. Give it up for Mincy. Shot clock at one. She got it off in time, but it doesn't touch anything, so it's a shot clock violation. You know, the Connecticut Huskies, when you look at Gino Aurea and this team, they have been the nation's best offense and best defense. They lead the country in field goal percentage and field goal percentage defense. You can't hit a three against them. They hold you to 27% from three and hold opponents to 48 points a game and 31% shooting. Across the board, those are tops in the country on defense. Everyone talks about their offense. Tuck on another back down. That shot has been there for her all evening so far. 22-16. Maryland has not lost a game since December 3rd. They've won 28 in a row since then. Straight on, but a little too much iron. And a whistle underneath, a foul. Yeah, you, 10 26 to go. This will go against Maryland. And you can't do that if you're Melina Howard because you're already in a bind because Jones is on the bench with two fouls. Stewart had inside position on the rebound. If you can't make the play, fouls are precious tonight. Four for Maryland. UConn has committed only one. That may not go up in the next 10 minutes. Number one in the country and fewest fouls per game. Let's get a Lewis with a mid-range jumper. Strokes into the game. She is the first substitute for Gino tonight. But could not corral the rebound. Halfway through the first half here in Tampa. Great to have you with us. 
Lexi Brown drawing a lot of attention by Geno's team. Walker Kimbrough, too strong. Look at Jefferson win the rebounding battle, the smallest player on the floor. She zips it up ahead, and a wild pass by Kalina Mosqueda Lewis. She did have an open shooter. Well, how hard does Mariah Jefferson play on every possession? Don't let that lean frame fool you. That is the heart of a champion. Well, UConn talks about how she has changed in terms of leadership, maturity, and scoring ever since the Stanford loss in November. A light seemed to come on after that defeat for her. Well, it had to because you were able to play five on four because she was an unwilling scorer. Brown off the face. Pavlik, shot clock to five. Another big stop here for UConn. Pavlik launches and drains the three. Boy, I tell you, to, to be so limited in minutes for so long and Pavlik to make that shot, really good stuff. Stewart stumbling, but able to maintain command of the basketball. Chloe Pavlik, she wants Doris Burke's job one day. Well, she's going to have it because what a personality on Chloe Pavlik. Wants to be a sports broadcaster. Jefferson. Trying to get out of there. Now a tie up for it. It'll stay on this end. You love the competitive spirit. And one of the greatest strengths of Brenda Fries is her ability to make these kids believe. Only four on the shot clock. Mincy to return now for Coach Fries. Brenda named the Big Ten Coach of the Year. Remember Maryland now in the Big Ten. And the first time in that conference, they ran the table 18 and 0. What a job they did. Stewart fires it up there and draws the foul. And Brenda is hot. And she is hot. She thought that was a great contest with no contact. Let's see. We get the benefit of a second look. The exchange is made. I don't blame her. That looks like it's a good defensive play. Foul on Walker Kimbrough, her first. Well, Stewart hits the first shot. She's an 80% foul shooter. Harrison will step out. Furman on. Look at her final four numbers in her career. Twice now, the most outstanding player. 23 points, eight rebounds. Has raised her game when it has mattered most. Chloe Pavlik is operating at the point guard spot. Keep in mind, Pavlik in the NCAA tournament has only played one game, and she played three minutes. So how about the three she made on the last possession? Keep yourself ready. Walker Kimbrough along the baseline from his shot, won't fall, tucked with the board. Jefferson always looking up for an open shooter. 24-19, here's Stewart launching. Furman outfights Tuck for the rebound. The Terps 0-3 all-time against UConn. The Huskies beat them last in the 2013 Sweet 16. Furman jumping in again. And a rebound knocked away, and they'll keep it on this end. Now, the Terps have been here before. Brenda Fries has done an extraordinary job coaching Maryland, getting this program into the national spotlight under duress of the shot clock. She hadn't played very much, delivers it. Coach can't believe it. Lead on Maryland. Here's Holly Roll with Brenda Fries. Well, Coach, your team got down early, but they punched their way back in. What did you think was the turning point offensively to operate better? Well, you know, our kids are battling. Uh, they're being aggressive. They're going the rim. Uh, you know, maybe when we get a few of those calls going our way, uh, maybe it'll be a different game. But uh, I love the fight that we're playing with, the energy, and uh, we're going to keep battling. Why did you have the belief right now to go to Chloe off the bench? She's only played a few minutes in the NCAA tournament. Well, uh, she's, she's shown it. She's shown it in the last three days in practice. I know what she could do against UConn. She showed us the last two years. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. I remember one game where Chloe Pavlik came in against UConn, actually played very, very well, but one significant play, she went sailing into the broadcast station and slamming into a certain play-by-play -play announcer. Yeah. His Coca-Cola went everywhere. His boards were unreadable after that. I'll never forget her. Now, this is a player who, again, has been through some injuries after starting as a freshman, being put in a tough spot, delivered in a big way, and now kept herself ready in a five-second violation, the sixth Maryland turnover. You see Mincy a little confused and Brenda Freeze a little upset that they give away the basketball there. The backboard here, Stewart. 
It's been to a, break the pressure. It's been a very quiet first 12, 15 minutes approaching for Kalina Muscata Lewis. Who has broken the all time made three point record. There's Stokes wriggling free underneath. And that's the biggest lead of the ball game for UConn up by seven. With seven and a half to go here in the opening half. Well, if you missed the first national semifinal, you missed a lot. Here's Pavlik again. Off target, off to the right of the iron. Notre Dame winning in the final seconds and really winning as much with defense on the final stop of Tiffany Mitchell, who is left inconsolable and in tears. Here's Kalina Muscata Lewis. What you were asking for a moment ago, where was she? She can get hot in a hurry. Well, the most prolific shooter in the history of women's college basketball from distance. The prettiest shot I have ever seen. And there's seven to go in the half. And now a 10-point lead for the Huskies. Mincy looking for help. She averages 14 points a game. Brown on target. Lexi Brown gets 13 a contest. Watching her play in this half, it's hard to understand if she ever battles confidence problems. The game is there, the mindset is there. When she's engaged, boy, very difficult to guard her. Lexi has pointed to the rematch with Notre Dame should it come. That's the last opponent to beat Maryland as the driving force for this Maryland team. That rattles in a three-pointer for Stewart, who has nine points, and that brings a timeout for the Maryland Terrapins. And the lead expands to 11. Uh, it just comes at you from so many different positions. You know, you send a lot of defensive attention to Kalina Muscata Lewis. It leads to a Stokes basket. You have a little dribble exchange. Your Shatari Walker Kimbro, you sink in. You don't give yourself an opportunity to close out on time. And Brianna Stewart makes your life difficult. Let's check in with Holly Rowe. Well, Brianna Stewart has been a winner almost all of her life. She started out with a basketball in her hands as a very young lady. We've got some pictures from her dad, Brian, and she is so precious there with her Easter basket on Easter. But here comes the baller phase with the ball in her hand. She grew very quickly with one of the tallest players on our team as an eighth grader was a starter on their varsity team. And look at this, folks. Since eighth grade, she has won 91 percent of her games. I think the ball in her hands at three years old got her off to a really good start. Yeah. I like that picture. I think it's worked out pretty well. Those are adorable photos. Oh, how cute. Picked off by Jefferson. And she'll outrace everybody for two. This is one of those patented UConn runs. And this is one of those instances where your offense has got to be able to match what they're putting on you right now. And they come with the bigger lineup, Stokes, Stewart, and Tuck up front. So scoring on the interior with that length and size is very difficult. Everybody talks about withstanding the patented UConn run. Few can do it. Walker Kimbrough with a jumper, nails it when they desperately need it. She has half a dozen. Terrific decision. The matchup was difficult for Stewart. Stewart with a bump. That's going to be an offensive foul. A charge on Stewart. Furman getting into position. And Stewart ran right into her. Now all of the tools to be successful just slides down, beats Stewart to the spot, gives up the body, and gets her team a possession. I think important to note, and officials talk about it all the time, your feet do not have to be planted. Correct. That's exactly right. You can be moving if you get to that spot first. Walker Kimbo trying to work around the screen. Howard dumping it down low. A quick strike, a well-run play for Jones. Yeah, and Brenda pulling all the right strings. She wants to give Jones an opportunity because they need easy baskets. And so you come back, even though she's got two fouls, she gets the defender sealed high. A nice play by Jones. She has another quick guard in the game, and that's going to be a foul against UConn. They're going to get Tuck. A Tuesday at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. Watch ESPN. Join us here again for the NCAA Women's Championship pregame show presented by Capital One, followed by the National Championship game. What did Brenda Freeze tell Holly Rowe? It'd be nice if I got the benefit of the whistle, and I couldn't agree more. Well, in the last couple, the whistle has started to go her way, and appropriately so. All the right calls made there against UConn. Howard handing off for Mosley. Renee Mosley, they call it Bones. She's asking for some motion. Shot clock at seven. 
Kick back out for Walker Kimbrell. Shovel to Moses. Shot clock down to two. Trying to get it in the air. The teardrop won't fall. Never got to the rim. So a shot clock violation. That's the third time that's happened for Maryland here in the first half. I think UConn traditionally has been the prettiest offensive team in the country to watch with Notre Dame being a close second. But the reason Gino Oriema has won nine titles is he has been one of the best defenses in the country year in and year out. Shredding the defense, tucked going right down the middle. 36-25. Maryland likes to score quickly too. Here's Mosley off the backboard. I'm not sure that's what she wanted. No, she came up with the Jordan hands as if to say, oh, I didn't really think the bank was open. Underneath Stokes, yes. UConn not waiting around either. With the smaller lineup, you have got a problem at the three, four, and five spot if you're Maryland. Jones and Howard have got to be terrific defensively. Jones on the baseline, up against Stokes to her right. Stokes with another block. One of the great shot blockers in the country, but a bad pass. And now they have numbers, a four on one. Back for Howard for two. You see everybody else was in transition. Nobody expected the turnover. So a surge here by Maryland as they cut the lead to eight. You love the fight and the spirit. Stewart tripped up, hits the deck in a foul with 3.06 on the clock in the first half. We'll take a timeout. UConn with an eight-point lead on the Maryland Terrapins. Uh, Tom Cruise on the big board here in Tampa. It is 38-30. UConn with the lead. Doris tickets inside the play. We were talking about the mastery of Mariah Jefferson. So this pick and roll is here, but she's going to refuse it. Why is she going to refuse it? Because she knows that defender down at the bottom has got to help on the nation's best shooter, which means what? That lane is wide open. So Kalina Mosqueda Lewis has only made one three, but two defenders go with her anyway, which means Stokes can get out of the ten. I mean, it doesn't, they can come at you from all areas. Jefferson pulls all the right strings, and don't underestimate the only one made three from Mosqueda Lewis. She's still impacting this game. One for five shooting so far. Not on the floor at the moment. Jefferson has 11 to lead all scores. Stokes on a high set. Back for Nurse, the freshman. And Stewart tangled up and hits the deck, and they're trying to be physical with her. Stanford and Tara Vanderveer, the outstanding coach for Stanford, they really set, I think, the template for the rest of the country, how they might choose to play. Brianna, and there's a look at the great Tara Vanderveer, who's watching the Final Four as well. I mean, Brianna, uh, Brianna has gotten to the place now, Dave, that she said, if teams are not physical with me, I am surprised. And I think she prides herself on the fact that she has, over the course of two plus years at UConn, become so much stronger, built a better base so that people cannot knock her off balance as much. 39-30, UConn. Coming up in the last two and a half minutes of our second semi. Mosley up beyond the three. Howard with a 17-footer, but that's too much. Stewart grabs another rebound. Jefferson, a little 5-7 guard from Glen Heights, Texas. Had a standout first half. Nurse finding the lane. Got a little bit fortunate that pass deflected off a of Maryland leg. Stewart open for three. Here it comes. Too strong. Leslie had the rebound. Her brother CJ Leslie was a star at North Carolina State. He's now playing overseas. Howard back for Lexi Brown. Here it comes. Yes. She drills it tonight. She's a very confident shooter. All by herself. Just, yeah, Pop said, you know, we put in a lot of time in the gym. There's a price to be paid to have that level of ability. Dad liked it right on top of the rim, too. Here's Tuck. Strong drive. Knocks in two more. She has 10. 41-33, the Huskies. And the Huskies go zone. You better believe they're going to identify Lexi Brown. A lot of communication in the white jerseys. Now, Skata Lewis about to return for Gina Oriema. Long one coming. Around and out. 
That wouldn't fall for Mosley. Stewart beating everyone to the other end, but UConn decides to come up slowly as we approach one minute to go in the half. Tuck lines it up and buries it. How diverse is her offensive game? She scored on the prior possession with a quick post-up move. You can see that knee brace she's playing with slips down on her occasionally. She's got to take a minute to pull it back up. UConn five threes by four different players. You've talked about how they can attack you. Here's Lexi Brown glancing off the iron on the run. Here comes Jefferson. She has Nurse with her. She'll do it herself. And went into the photographers. A foul on the play will go against Connecticut. With 30.7, that's on Stewart, number two. Now, Morgan Tuck was not a first-team All-American. UConn is only allowed, as you see, she sells that little drive by thinking the dribble handoff is coming at her. And this is a little post-up play for ball reversal into a three-point shot. Really nicely done. You're going to get the WBCA to reconsider. Well, here's the thing. As a team, you're only allowed to nominate three of your own players. And so the three first-team All-Americans, Mariah Jefferson, Brianna Stewart, and Kalina Mosqueda-Lewis, all well-deserved. But, but the versatility of Morgan Tuck on both ends of the floor is why UConn can mask its step. And I thought she was a first-team All-American. Some in stores would like them to change the rule. Mosley outside, shot clock down to 11. And the foul with 11 and a half seconds to go. And that'll be number two on Morgan Tuck. Well, coming up on the Northwestern Mutual Halftime Report, we'll have Muffet McGraw live on the set. She's still going to be smiling. And Kara and Rebecca on first half analysis of this one. And we'll certainly look back at Notre Dame's amazing victory over South Carolina. Final seconds of the half, and the heave is in and out by Mosley. That's the end of the first half, and UConn will go sailing into the locker room with an 11-point lead and 20 minutes away from facing the only team that can say they have figured out the Huskies in recent years, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Let's go to Holly Roll with Brianna Stewart. Hey, Brianna, Maryland is really running, and the pace of this game is really fast, and UConn's running, too. How are you guys holding up from a tempo and conditioning standpoint? Uh, I think we're holding up really well. We know that we want to push in transition as well, and, you know, it's just a fine line of, of going fast and then knowing when to slow down a little bit. How are you guys doing defensively finding them in transition? Uh, I think we're doing a better job. You know, we started off a little slow in the first half, and, you know, we've got to limit the layups we give up. How do you do that? Uh, help side. Thanks so much. A bit of a grin there when she said help side. She has 10 points so far. We're at halftime, 44-33. UConn with the lead on Maryland. Now it's time for us to join Kevin Nagandi and the crew for the Northwestern Mutual halftime report. Dave Doors, thank you so much. Kevin Nagandi here with Carol Lawson. Gina with a big smile as we welcome you back to the NCAA Women's Championship presented by Capital One. The second half of our second national semifinal still to come. UConn with a 44-33 lead over Maryland. Right now to Holly Roll with Maryland's Lexi Brown. Coach, asked you guys to be tough and punch back when UConn goes on their runs. What do you think you guys have done well in doing that? You pulled within six at one point. Um, I think we were just attacking their defense, you know, pushing it back at them. You know, UConn's going to score, so what we have to do is, you know, push the ball in transition and just play how we know how to play. So the problem is you pull within six, but then they score, score, score. What do you have to change defensively? Um, you know, we just have to communicate. We're having communication breakdowns. You know, our, their pick and roll, we're giving us a little bit of issues, and their pick and slips, we're giving us some issues. So really, it's coming down to communication. Just talk more. Yes. All right, thanks. Thanks, Holly. Dave O'Brien and Doris Burke back with you. Well, she has nine. Lexi's had a nice half, but three UConn players are already into double figures. What has to happen in the second half for Maryland? Well, I think we need to hear from the senior Lauren Mincy as you take a look at the first half stats. Connecticut, I did not think, played exceptionally well. I think this is my skewed perception of reality. 57%. They, they go five for 11 from three. They have 10 assists on 17 baskets, and I think still there's more in them. They out-rebounded. They out-assisted. They outshot, obviously outscored Maryland, and yet you do have that lingering feeling. UConn can be a lot better. 
Jones with the entry, missing. Stewart comes over and blocks it out of play so on she, the second effort. She did her job. She buried that post defender so deep, Brianna Jones, that she got the easy opportunity. When she missed the chippy, the backside help and the length and wingspan of Stewie makes her pay for the first miss. Morgan Tucker, 13 points, six rebounds to lead the way for UConn. Stolen away, Kalina Mosqueda Lewis comes up with it to Jefferson. And waiting on her teammates to set it up, tuck in the corner. Tuck hit a three-pointer as well, not one too strong off the window. Stewart keeps it alive though. And the UConn fans, and there are many of them here in Tampa, remaining on their feet until they score for the first time in the half. Nurse lost the handle. At times, she's played very nervously. And has admitted to the nerves. She said the stage, certainly, the elevated stage has gotten to her a little bit. Mincy. Walker Kimbrough. Can't connect on the three. Jefferson again off to Kalina Mosqueda Lewis. And the point guard will set it up. She hits 50.5% beyond the three in her own right. And Stewart is fouled from behind. They'll get Molina Howard for the personal. That's her second. We mentioned that Maryland came through a very challenging bracket to get to Tampa. They're the team that ended Princeton's run of perfection. The only loss all year for Princeton came at Maryland. In the second round, a tie up here with 18.27 to go. We'll stay right here on this end. Then they traveled all the way across the country to beat two top 25 opponents back to back in Spokane, including Tennessee, and they beat a top 25 opponent in Duke. So they've been battle tested. There is no question about what they did in this season of a new conference with so many new roles as Tuck gets another three. This has been a special season for Brenda Fries and her group, no matter what happens in this ball game. Well, now they have to dig their way out of a 47-33 deficit. Just two minutes into the second half. Brown on the baseline. Mincy partially blocked by Stewart. It comes to Nurse. They run again. Beautifully done. Stewart will lay it in on a fast break. Uh, how about Stewart and the closeout? Brenda's going to get a timeout because this is getting away fast. Stewart on the closeout to block a shot. Sprints end to end for the easy bucket. How many times have we seen it? An opponent is within range. And then all of a sudden, the first few minutes of the second half, there go the Huskies. In transition. So dangerous. So many options. Such an unselfish team. Gino Oriano's numbers are staggering. He's won over 87% of his games. He's coached in 16 Final Fours and won nine championships. And this weekend, he can join UCLA legend John Wooden in the history books with 10 titles. An incredible run. Now, Gino never compares the two sports, men's and women's basketball, or what he's done to John Wooden's accomplishments, the Wizard of Westwood. But for quite a while, he used to carry John Wooden's book around in his briefcase. He is 9-0 and in championship games. Every time he's made it to the national championship, he's won at 9-6 and six in the semis. And I say it every time I cover him. If you want to understand why Connecticut has been that successful, watch him practice for five minutes. They do the details of the everyday as well as you can do them. Offensive foul will go against Maryland as we bring in Holly Rowe. Well, Jeannie Ariema has looked up to John Wooden, and he said, you know, I was actually in California at a clinic and got to meet him. And I spoke to him about 15 minutes. He put his hand on my leg. We had a great time. And years later, I saw this quote in Sports Illustrated, what John Wooden loves about UConn. And he said, I've never met that Gino Ariema, but he seems like a nice kid. Gino said, it crushed me he doesn't remember me, but boy, do I remember him and what an influence he's had on me. <laughs> How do you spend 15 minutes with Gino and not remember him? You would have thought he would have fired off one wisecrack in yeah. that 15 minutes. I would, I would think so. I've been fortunate enough to meet John Wooden as well. And uh, it was an amazing experience. What a gentleman. Gino says the same thing. Absolutely adored him. 
Well, John Wooden has talked all the time about how much of a fan of not only UConn, but women's basketball because of the unselfish play, the, the constant movement, the screening necessary to get open shots. It reminded him of how his UCLA teams have played. Five seconds as Maryland could not get it in. A violation by Pavlik. And well, a look by Brenda Freeze tells the story. Down 51 to 33. Stewart nearly picked from behind. Here's Mosqueda Lewis. Stewart with a difficult catch. Not many make that play. The swing for Tuck, another three, in and out. And she's hit a couple of those tonight, not necessarily a big part of her game. 16 and a half to go, Pavlik straight on, and that didn't touch anything. I thought, I thought Stewie might have gotten a piece of that, but I guess not. There's trying to get out of the backcourt. Tuck, on the spin. Yes. That is a player right there. UConn has outscored the Terps 9 to nothing in the second half. They're up by 20. Walker Kimbrough. Battle for the rebound. Pavlik has it. Jones in close, spins in two. That is a very capable low post score. Boy, when she gets deep position, that frame is so wide and so strong, you are not going to be able to do anything but foul her. And she was on the coaches all Big Ten first team. Went sprawling for that to the backcourt. Tuck another three. Again in and out. She missed a wide open Stewart underneath the rim. Stewart hit the deck. Walker Kimbrough goes around the back. Pavlik to set it up now for the Turks. We have never beaten UConn. Howard got a great look, but it won't drop. She came crashing in and kicked it out of play. Well, UConn can, can come at you from five positions. They are dynamic scorers all over the floor. Morgan Tuck, one of those pieces. Her versatility crucial. They get her isolated at the post, put the defender in the spin cycle softly off the orange. Her heave at the buzzer did not go. And there's the Notre Dame coaching staff doing some scouting on UConn. They're into the final. It starts at 7.30 Eastern with a pregame show. The game itself tipping at 8.30 Eastern on Tuesday. Can't wait for that. Boy, what a model of consistency the Irish program has been. Five straight final fours. A rare miss on an uncontested look, but tough there to clean it up. And four times in the last five years, Notre Dame is in the national championship game. Amazing. Yeah, uh, Sally Jenkins did a terrific piece that aired on our pregame show about the futility, as some would see it, in Notre Dame not winning national championships in their prior trips. I talked to Muffet about it. It's anything but a failure. You know, winning and losing, they are part and parcel. You, you don't do one without the other. The lessons have got to come. And, you keep knocking on the door of your Notre Dame and you will get your second national title. Well, they are one team and the only team who can say this that in certain seasons has had UConn's number as Jones cleans that one up and lays it in. So if it turns out indeed to be UConn, what a matchup that'll be on Tuesday night. Still time for Maryland to get back in this thing, fouling Stewart from behind though. That's on Mosley. Let's check in with Holly Rowe. Well, Dave, that's exactly what Melina Howard of Maryland was just begging her teammates in the huddle to do. She said, we've got plenty of time left, guys. We have got to play hard. This team cannot break us. We have to stay together right now. She was pleading with her teammates. But the bad news is I walked over into the UConn huddle and I heard Gino Oriema say, guys, this is the time. They're getting ready to put their foot on the pedal even more. Wow. Well, Gino's been there before. The swing for Nurse, the open three. A high rebound to Jefferson. And a new shot clock for the Huskies. It feels like they've missed an opportunity when Brianna Stewart's been in scoring range to get her the ball. She makes her own offense there. Fouled there, she'll go to the line. One of the many things that Stewart does exceptionally well. She makes 80%, fouled by Brianna Jones, her third. Do you think about some of the great players in UConn history, Nikisha Sales, Diana Taurasi-Subird, 
when Gina was asked about Brianna Stewart's ability to raise her game, she said, you know, he said, it, great players have that ability. But of all the great players I've had, she may end up being the best in the toughest moments. And that's saying something with their history and lineage. Well, she became the, look at her mom and dad, the sixth UConn Husky to win the Wade Trophy Award. Eight times in all, Maya Moore took it home three times. Tarazi, Bird, Rizzotti, and a, the great Rebecca Lobo, of course. That's on target, a three-pointer. So that cuts the lead back to 17. With about 13 and a half to go. Score to the baseline. No, she misses that one. She has a smile on her face as she drops up the floor. She can't believe the way things are going that she missed it. Mosley will set it up now. Brenda Freeze calling out a play. Third final four for Freeze in Maryland. They won it all in 2006. Mosley gets that one. Yeah, good job by Brene Mosley because you have Kalina Mosqueda Lewis on you. Not the best individual defender, particularly if you put her on the perimeter in that kind of bind and mismatch. And she went right at her. So the lead at 15. Stewart wide open from three and all next. What is that a pretty shot? That is, and what a beautiful screen by Kia Nurse. The UConn is a team that looks for ways to create opportunities for their teammates. Walker Kimbrough backs it away from Nurse. Trying to drive it now on the freshman. The back won't drop. Rebound tapped out high. Maryland with a save and a foul by UConn. It'll go against Kalina, her third. Well, here's a play that won't show up in a box score, but watch the right side of your screen. What Nurse does, she is calling for Brianna Stewart to come up the floor because she's positioned the screen perfectly, and Stewie delivers. Stewart, the two-time Associated Press Player of the Year, Mosley again, not this time. Mosqueda Lewis draws the foul. Winning the Wade Trophy. And many more honors to come, you would think. In fact, it was Diana Tarazi who just said the other day, if you're going to beat her, if she's not going to win a championship one year, it better be now because you're not going to get her as a senior. Very confidently said, it better be her junior year. Otherwise, she's going to win four. Well, if, if anybody knows uh, championship basketball, it's Diana Tarazi. You think of her final two seasons as a junior and senior, it's two of the outstanding individual performances. The pieces around Diana were solid. They were not great. She was brilliant. I think the most often referenced player, former player for Gina Loriano. Would yeah, you agree? I agree. He talks about Diana more than any of the great players he's had, and he's had so many. That's going to be a charge with 12.01 to go here in the second half. And UConn in a very comfortable spot. Nurse with her second. UConn and Maryland own the two longest winning streaks, active streaks in Division I. Maryland's is 28 in a row. UConn's is 35 straight coming into play tonight. Lexi Brown trying to drive around Tuck. 10 to shoot for the Turks. Well, what exchanging on the perimeter. Just great team defense there. The blow by, though, by Mosley. Down she goes. She took a pretty tough hit there. Fouled with 11.35 remaining. And we'll take a timeout. 60 42, the Huskies in command. But maybe in the season for Maryland, UConn on top 60 to 42. Let's go to Holly with the animated Gina Oriema. Well, Coach, with a big lead like this, what is your emphasis down the stretch? You said this time of year you got to worry more about yourselves than the opponent. What are you worried about right now? Well, exactly what you just saw you know when teams get down they put the ball on the floor they go in they throw themselves at you and then they're hoping that the ref bails them out which is exactly what just happened so yeah we got to make sure that we don't foul we don't stop the clock and give them easy buckets you know just and still stay on the attack though we don't want to slow the game down thank you coach You're welcome.
All right, let's take a look at that last one here as Mosley came down the lane. What do you think? Stokes with the foul here. Oh, I absolutely thought it was a foul. Did she initiate the contact? Yes. Was she looking to draw that whistle? Yes, but I thought it was a foul from Stokes. So we beg to differ with Gino Oriama. Eric Bruton with the foul. Well, he wants every call, even when he has an 18-point lead. He wants everything he can get. Part of what makes him a great coach. 11.35 remaining. Maryland playing in the Final Four in back-to-back -back years. After downing Tennessee in the Elite Eight. Maryland has not lost since a December 3rd defeat at Notre Dame. That was four months ago. Look at their leading scores. Morgan Tuck leading the way with 20 already. And 17 for Stewart. Mosley at the line. And buries the first. He's a 77% foul shooter. I wonder if off some made free throws, made baskets, does Maryland push up into pressure, try to make UConn make some mistakes. They've got a small lineup on the floor. You've got four guards and Brianna Jones, and indeed they come with a little bit of pressure. Jefferson had an outstanding first half for Coach Oriema. Here's Stewart. Stokes setting the screen. That's short, though, and around and out. Here's Mosley for three. Trying to bring them back. Off the mark, but kept uh, in Maryland's hands as the rebound is poked free. What do you think? Is UConn settling for too many threes? Well, with the size advantage that they have, they're into their big lineup at this point. So I would go at Maryland on the interior, certainly. Mosley trying to take the baseline. Back for Harrison. Yes. That's just Harrison. She hopes to be a sports broadcaster one day. Communications major at Maryland. So back to 14. Now, Kia Stokes is not an offensive threat necessarily except off, off offensive glass. So she's got to be a screener. For Stewart. Tied up and fouled. She'll be at the line. Stops the clock with 10.24 remaining. Catch the Frozen Four second semifinal from Boston as the hometown Terriers of Boston University in a great hockey town face North Dakota Thursday at 8.30 Eastern on ESPN2. Has Tom Cruise ever done a hockey film? I, has he? I don't think he has. Oh. He's done a football film. You're the movie buff, so you yeah. scared me with the question. I thought you were baiting me into a did, wrong did answer. I did not mean to frighten you. I'd never do that. <laughs> I hear the next Mission Impossible is ridiculous. Unbelievable. The special effects, the stuff that Tom Cruise, I hear, I hear it's incredible. Well, you're the movie aficionado, yeah. so I trust you. If it bombs, don't come looking for a refund from me. 10-17 <laughs> to play. I'm sure it'll be a big hit. Now, UConn goes into this zone. Bounce up top for Conquer. Good ball movement here, the entry for Jones. Godfrey, the open shooter. Well, they did everything right except make the jumper. They really did. They got a post-entry pass. The ball changed sides of the floor. They got an uncontested look, just couldn't make the shot. Elena Mosqueda Lewis beating Stokes in close for two. Well, you know, Stokes, her you know, minutes vary depending on the matchup, but whenever that young woman has been needed historically, she has delivered. You know, Emma has really used her surgically in this tournament and most of the season, employing her at just the right time to come in and block some shots. Mosqueda Lewis misfiring on the three. It has not been her night, although tipped out of play off of Maryland with 9.29 remaining. They have not needed her, and seldom does UConn have to rely on one player to carry the offense. Well, let's remember this. This is not only the most prolific, but the best by percentage in the country. I mean, she's up around 50% from deep. Tuck fouled. She'll be back to the line. Maryland doing a lot of fouling on the interior. Well, what did you notice? Last couple of possessions, in fact, I think Connecticut has decided, okay, enough jump shots. Let's go ahead and filter it through the post. Brianna Jones, her fourth foul. Tuck makes 75%. She was all-conference first team in the American Conference. And before tonight, one of the four UConn players to compile 100 assists, but Kalina Mosqueda-Lewis has now joined that group. 
really kind of staggering to think about one team having five players yeah. with like a point guard's kind of numbers. Correct. You know, it's, it's rare, Dave, where the vast majority of your starting lineup and your substitutes, and this is not a deep Connecticut team, have a positive assist to turnover ratio, particularly the post players. That's incredibly rare. But this is the emphasis for UConn. I'm not sure which is more egregious to Gino, turnovers or fouling, but both you know, are emphasized in their practices. Berman trying to get free, but a foul. Stops the clock at 9.13 remaining. 20-point lead here for UConn. It's looking more and more like a rematch between the Huskies and the Fighting Irish on Tuesday for the National Crown. Boy, what, they're familiar foes, and Gabby Williams getting her first opportunity here in the final nine minutes of play. And You wonder, did he want to get her some experience and moments of prosperity with the idea that on Tuesday night he might need his most dynamic athlete? Mosley with the pass tipped out of play. They'll keep it. With exactly nine minutes to go. Gabby had a very good freshman year, named to the American Conference All-Freshman Team, and also the conference sixth player of the year. Her athleticism jumps off the page. Well, there she is jumping yeah. and off of her. That's some tight defense. 16 on the shot clock for the Terrapins. You can see how few minutes she has played in the last couple of minutes. I mean, the last couple of games, 18 total. Herman denied on the drive, back out for Brown. Shot clock down to six, weaving inside. The bounce, back out. Here's Mosley. Got it. That is, that is a young woman who is unafraid. Uh, I just like the way Brene Mosley conducts herself. Here to compete. Maryland, five out of 18 beyond the three-point line. Jefferson high on the wing. Stewart on from, and I should say it was Gabby Williams back out for Tuck, and she'll hit it. She knocks down another one. Is there a spot on the floor where Morgan Tuck has not made a shot tonight? I don't think so. She has 24 points. Now you came on the air tonight talking about the fact that she may be underappreciated on those All-American lists, and she's kind of gone out and proved your point. Jefferson. Back for Williams. She's doubled up. Let's get Lewis on the drive. Even her layups are not dropping tonight. She's one for eight shooting it. National semifinal number two. Notre Dame survived over South Carolina winning a one-point thriller in the first one on this floor here tonight. Came down to the final heave at the buzzer by Tiffany Mitchell of South Carolina. What a great year the Gamecocks had. It ended here. Stewart with a block. Keeps on playing despite the big lead. We'll take a timeout. 721 remaining. 68-49 UConn. The NCAA Women's Championship is presented by the Capital One Venture Card. Earn unlimited double miles you can use with no blackout dates. Capital One Cup impact performance in Morgan Tuck has been splendid. Yet another terrific performance. She's 10 for 16. This was the first basket of the game. She sprints on a rim run, working the offensive glass against an undersized Shatari Walker Kimbrough. What a night. 24 points, seven boards. Brown fires into the side of the backboard there. So with 7-14 remaining, UConn has a 68-49 lead. And the Huskies bearing down on a return trip to the national championship game, which is Tuesday night. If they get there, foul will go against Maryland and Turdy Furman. Trying to hold up Brianna Stewart. 704 many. Let's go to Holly. Well, Morgan Tuck having the night of her life, 24 points in this game, but this has been two years in the making. I saw a special moment between her and Gino Oriema two years ago. UConn had just won the national championship, and the UConn players were laughing, running through the lobby of a hotel, cheering, and having a great time, and Gino cornered Morgan Tuck. Took her over to the corner, and pretty soon he had her in tears. I heard him say to her, 
I believe you can be the best player in the country. Do you believe it? And, and she was shy with her answer. And then he said, no, I believe that you can be the best player in the country. And soon he had her in tears. Finally, she agreed, and they have worked toward this moment. The buttons that Gino pushes are amazing, and two years in the making, Morgan Tuck is finally making him proud. Mosley from the corner. From the back up and in for two is 6.40 to go. And I, the value of Morgan Tuck for me, in particular on this UConn team, is important for this reason. You know, they play six, maybe seven players, depending on whether Shania Chong gets minutes. Morgan Tuck's ability to play multiple positions on both ends masks a little bit of that lack of depth. She can slide between the three, four, and five on both ends. 6'2 sophomore from Bolingbrook, Illinois. Stewart wriggling inside and spins in two. He has 23. I'd say quiet 23 tonight. No, oh, absolutely. You know, she's missed some shots that we are accustomed to seeing her finish with a high degree of difficulty. But look at the other areas with which she's contributed. Seven rebounds, three assists, and three blocks. Mosley outside the three, working on the freshman Williams, who commits a foul. It was with eight on the shot clock. Back to Stewart on the other end. You know, Jefferson, a nice little touch pass, has to make the adjustment in the air. So much stronger. You know, so much better at absorbing contact and not getting knocked off balance. Anna Jones at the line, rattles in one. She's a kinesiology major, wants to be a pediatrician one day. 6'3", sophomore, and a Maryland native. There's plenty of talent coming back from Maryland and some reserves in the making, some big-time talent entering. So Maryland is going nowhere on the national stage. And Lauren Mincy's the only senior. Lexi Brown's only a sophomore. She's already appeared in two Final Fours. That is correct. Elena Mosqueda-Lewis shoveling to Williams on the attack, lays it in. So you like, and, and these minutes you don't think they're important, but Gina Oriama is taking the temperature of Gabby Williams. You know, if she had come out here and underperformed, committed fouls and turnovers, he couldn't think about using her Tuesday. Now she's comporting herself in such a way it gives you confidence if you need to pull the trigger. Swung up top for Mincy. Really had a standout senior year. Bang it inside with Williams and draws the foul. 14 points, four rebounds, three and a half assists a game for Lauren Mincy. Let me ask you about Gino Oriema and some of the changes he would like to see that he talked about with us this week in women's college basketball. He'd like to see the rim brought to nine feet, which would allow players to dunk. He wants to see the lane widen. He'd like to see women's basketball go to a larger basketball. Today's ball slightly smaller in the women's game. And he wants to see it go to four 10-minute quarters instead of two 20-minute halves. What do you think? I'll say definitively, number three and number four. I would like the larger ball. I think that this one is too small and too bouncy. And it, it would be better. Women are bigger, stronger, faster. Uh, you have more control with the bigger ball. Plus, if you play against guys that pick up parks, you know, to play with that consistently, consistently, that's one. Number two, four 10-minute quarters. I like that as well. The, the nine, you know, lowering the rim slightly. Here's what I would like to see before we see that happen. Let's get USA Basketball to get some women gym. Let's lower the rims. He, his idea was don't tell anybody, as Mincy steps on the end line, don't tell anybody, let's just see what happens. Okay, because now the dynamic athletes uh, that women's basketball is starting to produce maybe can get above the rim and finish Men's volleyball and women's volleyball have different net heights and the athleticism is greatly Shown and we show it all the time on ESPN widening the lane. I would say this to you We're guessing a clock issue right now. That's why they're at the monitor one I think that the entire country needs to take a hard look at basketball at all levels, okay? Men's college basketball has got to reduce the shot clock from 35 to 30 seconds. That is a necessary first step. I also think that all levels of basketball in this country, beginning with bitty basketball on up, uh, you know, maybe starting in the middle school years, everybody operates under duress of the shot clock. The reason the Europeans are always skilled 
Dirk Nowitzki, guys with size, could step away and make shots. When you are forced to play with a shot clock, Dave, you are required to be a three-tool player because at any time, that 24-second clock can dwindle. And if you're not a three-tool player, you cannot play in that game. So it's there are a lot of things. Some high schools do not use it. Correct. In some parts of the country, they don't go with a shot clock. You, you want to make sure everybody's using a shot clock in that, in that sense. And I like the idea of widening the lane because we have seen Connecticut dominate games this year because they've got the best post players and they can get into that small lane and dominate. If you widen the lane, all of a sudden that becomes a little bit harder to do. Well, they took 19 seconds off the clock. So they reset the clock. 4.17 remaining here in Tampa. Now, one thing about Gino Oriema, he's constantly thinking about these things and changes that would benefit the women's game as Kalina Mosqueda Lewis goes down and draws the foul. Some of those are highly controversial. I'm not so sure about widening the lane. I'm not even so sure about the size of the ball, although when he talked about that, Kalina Mosqueda Lewis was sitting right beside him and she rolled her eyes and said, don't do that. I like it just the way it is. Well, well after, you shoot like she does. After tonight's performance, well, maybe tonight, you change your mind. Might change your mind. But I mean, typically, the All-American hits 50% of her threes. She's taken 31% of the Huskies three-pointers this season. And has had remarkable success, one of the great three-point shooters, one of the great shooters, period, in the history of women's college basketball. I did think his point about the different heights of the volleyball nets was significant yeah. and worthy of a look. And I, I plead ignorance on that. I didn't realize there was a difference. Ne neither did I. That the men's net was a little bit higher which I think goes to his point. Here's Furman, trying to wriggle free. Back up top for Mosley. Shot clock at seven, Mosley hits it. Oh, well, she's giving him a nice lift off the bench. They need about four more of her, yeah. unfortunately for Maryland. 75-56, Renee Mosley with a dozen points. She only averages five, and that one turned over. We will take a break as well. Brenda Freeze has done such a great job. One of her two beautiful boys is fast asleep right now. Three and a half minutes to go. Now both of the teams have been very open and certainly the head coaches have about their dislike for one another. Certainly the rivalry has, has uh, gone a little away from the civility that it was when we were in the league together. You know, this is a function of women's basketball. Sometimes we act like girls, like we're supposed to go to dinner every night. You know, we're supposed to play each other, try to beat each other's brains in, and then we're supposed to get together afterwards and go have a bottle of wine. That's not going to happen. Well, that was from a year ago, the bad blood between UConn and Notre Dame. They're on a collision course again. And we asked Gino about that specifically yesterday, you know, had that bad feeling been put to rest and in the first recruiting trip in April after the Final Four at the Bull Williams tournament, these two, Gino was standing there with Muffet's assistants. Muffet came right over, he looked at her, he said, are we good? And she said, oh yeah, we're good. And the two Philly natives uh, who had been longtime conference rivals got back to some cordiality. And it's going to be an interesting rematch. And I know everybody thinks it's a foregone conclusion that the Connecticut Huskies are going to win their 10th title. Make no mistake, the Irish have established a culture of winning. They are unfazed by the stage and will be unfazed by the jersey looking opposite them. I'm not telling you they won't get beat, but they will compete. Well, UConn did romp over them in last year's national championship, but both of them went in undefeated, didn't play during the regular season. 48 to go. And remember these two teams earlier this year as Jefferson gets one to go down. You and I were at the game. 76-58, a UConn win. Yes, meaning they, they played then no longer conference rivals. Correct, yes. Played in that contest in South Bend. And Notre Dame could not keep up with UConn in that one. They actually had a lead uh, in the first half, but it was a dominant UConn. We talked about their patented runs. The score was... You know, 76-52, I believe, and look, keep this in mind, though. Brianna Turner had, in the game prior, injured her shoulder. Muffet, very conservatively, she was not prepared to play physically, did not play, and we saw the length 
the athleticism, the ability to be a shot blocking presence, the sprinting and the rim runs that made her a factor. Stokes grabbing the rebound. Turner was terrific for long stretches of the first national semifinal. Gabby Williams will come on in, and the night is over for Tuck. 24 points and nine rebounds. Certainly Morgan Tuck, the star of this one, for Gina Oriema's team. Sonia John is now going to check in as well, and they're going to replace Mariah Jefferson. The other point I'll make is, as you see Lauren Mincy heads out on the other side, got a great hug from her head coach. One forty-seven to play. Jewel Lloyd had 31 points in that first matchup. It was a Notre Dame team who was about Jewel Lloyd and not much of very else. Good drive by Stewart. Not much of very else at that moment. They have since uh, added Lindsey Allen, who struggled in the national semifinal as a legit scorer from the point guard position. UConn didn't guard her in that first game. Now, coming off the performance she had, how UConn handles Lindsey Allen will be a very interesting question to be answered. Williams with the rebound. Gina Oriema bringing some subs in. He has Sanaya Chong on the floor now. And he's going to bring on another one. And Courtney Eckmark, this freshman, about to hit the floor. And that's it for Stewart, who will leave with 25 points. So 25 for Stewie, as they call her. Tuck with 24 to lead the way for the Huskies. Getting ready to play again for the national championship as Williams is hammered and fouled. And tomorrow night, it's Wisconsin and Duke squaring off in the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball National Championship game. Coverage on CBS beginning at 9 Eastern. For more information, go to NCAA.com. Williams at the line with a miss. Freshman from Sparks, Nevada. Kristen Confrey coming back on for Maryland. And Brenda greeting some of her regulars as they step off. Lexi Brown. The dad making the trip all the way from California. Dee Brown of the NBA. That's a little coaching for next year, that moment we just caught between Brenda and Lexi. Now Lexi establishing the beginning of a terrific career. She'll be a junior next year. Maryland's going to be loaded again. Jones swings it outside. Walker Kimbrough. Final seconds here from the floor at Tampa. UConn impressive as ever tonight. 81-56. They're going to have another big win in a national semifinal as Jones knocks it down. And now the talk will turn to UConn and Notre Dame in the national title Tuesday night right here on ESPN. That should be a doozy, folks. Foes that are familiar, the Irish number two in the country in offense, Connecticut number one, the two best offensive teams in the country square off. UConn about to go after championship number 10. They're in the final again. Gino Oriemma advancing to a third consecutive national championship. It's Notre Dame, their arch rival, Tuesday night at 8.30. Final score, 81-58. We'll have plenty more coming up next on Sports Center, and we'll return here to Tampa for interviews with Morgan Tuck, the star of the game, and Gino Oriema. But right now, it's time for Sports Center. <laughs> Gino's back again. Yeah. Tuesday night, right here on ESPN, the women's final, Notre Dame and UConn. As Dave Mensch will head back out there in a second. Uh, it'll be the 10th time he'll coach for a national championship. Yeah. You said earlier in those national championship games, the previous nine, he is perfect. Nine for nine. Yeah. Dynasty continues and the Yukon Huskies will take on Notre Dame. Uh, two schools that have a rivalry dating back to the Big East. Of course, it's different now, but we head back to Tampa right see now. Him right there. Look, there you go. Holly Rowe standing by with the head coach of the Yukon Huskies. Well, coach, what did you think was the biggest challenge your team faced in this game and how did they overcome it so easily? Well, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> um, I think the, the 
the, the biggest thing against Maryland is they can break you down with their guard play, you know, and, uh, and then they're so big inside. So if you make a mistake on the guards, you know, you got the big guys to deal with. And, and we just needed to try to make sure that we only gave up one thing, that we didn't give up both. So we try to concentrate on taking away their threes, which they're really good at, uh, and then try to create some mismatches down this end with Tuck and Stewie, because I thought that's where we had the advantage down here. So um, these guys are great to coach. You know, you give them a game plan and they follow it. Morgan Tuck here standing by. And Morgan, you are playing in this uh, final four, the most significant minutes you've ever played. What was it like at Lair? When did you start really feeling comfortable? Um, you know, I think after the first couple minutes, we started, uh, you know, we got the jersey on, we started feeling pretty good. So and it's great to be out here. Tell me what you thought in the first half, 13 points, those mismatches. How were you able to take advantage of those? Um, you know, we talked about that we had a mismatch in the post, and, you know, me and Stewie were both quicker than them, so I think we just tried to put on the floor and go by them. Coach Roy Emma, this sets up another matchup with Notre Dame. I feel like we've seen this story before. What will be different this time around? Uh, you know, every time we play Notre Dame, it's something. You know, um, that I, I just have a lot of respect for what what they've been able to do you know uh, uh, they, they've got a heck of a team and their team has gotten a lot better as the season's uh, going on you know uh, you know Jules a great player obviously but all their other players have gotten significantly better since the beginning of the season and um, you know it's going to be a great game I think I think we're the two best teams in the country um, and I'm glad that it's worked out that way um, uh, but today Sunday and I'll worry about them tomorrow I have one more thing for you to worry about. Brianna Turner didn't play in that last meeting. She was terrific for them tonight. What concerns you about defending her? Well, obviously, she's so skilled. I mean, um, you, you don't get a kid that can do as many things as she can around the basket. You know, she reminds me of Stewie a little bit, except she doesn't have, you know, the perimeter game Stewie has. But I think people forget that Brianna Jefferson didn't score and fouled out in that game. You know, so uh, I think we'll be okay. Thanks. We'll see you Tuesday night. Uh, I'm glad we will. Okay. <laughs> now back to you, Kevin Nagandi. Holly, thank you so much. Brianna Stewart, 25 points, 8 rebounds, and UConn advancing to their 10th national championship game. Only Tennessee has been to more, and UConn has never lost in a title game. 9-0 and here with Carol Lawson and Rebecca Lobo. So they're the best player in the country in Brianna Stewart. They have the best point guard in the country in Mariah Jefferson. They have the best shooter in Kalena Mosqueda Lewis. But it's Morgan Tuck who stood out here. This is not fair. 24 <laughs> points in this victory. Well, we talked about it before the game. It's not just Brianna Stewart who is going to provide a, a mismatch on the offensive end for the University of Connecticut. Morgan Tuck at 6'2 is such a versatile post player. And I thought she was terrific early on running the four. She put pressure on Maryland's defense by getting up and down. And the thing with Tuck is she's so slippery when she gets the ball inside. She can score even over bigger defenders. Terrific on the offensive glass. And this is a player who has versatility in terms of her range. She showed it tonight, hitting two three-pointers. So you talk about all the other things. What do you take away? Well, if you're going to leave Morgan Tuck, she's going to make you pay. Mariah Jefferson, this is her team. And she has the pulse of this team. And she runs with offense. Uh, she's able to be an elite defender on, on that end of the floor. And she just does a little bit of everything for this team. So statistics might not be as gaudy as some of her other teammates in tonight's game. But, man, did she have an impact. The hustle plays, her speed. I even saw her block a shot at five foot seven. <laughs> Let's thread the needle pass right here. A great dime to Morgan Tuck in transition. Mariah Jefferson and her maturity and how she's come along in this junior season. She does a little bit of everything. And I love that she's starting to do some of those things that maybe other point guards never reach. She's starting to feel point where players are supposed to go, put them in the right spot. She's just playing at a high level right Help now. Help me understand this. If I tell you the best shooter in the country has four points of Mosqueda Lewis, and they still win by 23 points against the one seed in Maryland, how do they do this? Well, she had seven assists. Yes. And so she passed the basketball very well. And the threat that Kalina Mosqueda Lewis is, that's what sets up everything for this team on the offensive end. Everyone is a threat. So whether you're efficient or not, teams have to respect what Kalina Mosqueda Lewis can do, whether she makes those shots or not. And so that allows for great player movement and great player execution. And Connecticut's guards have to be great because until the very end of the game, the only subs that came in were post subs. So those players are going to have to stay out of foul trouble when you go into the championship game and have to continue to be solid on the offensive end of the floor. UConn improves the 19-3 all-time in April. 
two of those, lo those losses against Notre Dame. But Gino Ariema eyeing a national title number 10. He gets the chance Tuesday night in a rematch against the Irish. Back to SportsCenter.